On this episode, we're going to review more about what took place during WrestleMania weekend. As you know, a lot of wrestling took place. Amongst them is AAA Lucha Libre with Invades WrestleCon, which was an amazing show with a lot of wrestlers from AAA, but also wrestlers here in the U.S. We even got New Japan Strong with Lone Star Shootout with a lot of good matches. Amongst them is Minoru Suzuki taking on the Killer Cross and many other things. Also, we got two ma events from the collective. Both of them are GCW events. One is, of course, Joey Janela's Spring Break 6 Part 2. And, of course, Effie's Big Gay Brunch. And also, we cannot forget since it's Wednesday, and you all know what that means, we got AEW Dynamite. And, of course, if there's any news updates, I will post those out as well. So, let's get ready for another episode of the Leader Wrestle Zone. Welcome everybody to the Lead at Wrestle Zone. All things that is pro wrestling with AEW, NXT, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Impact Wrestling, the National Wrestling Alliance, various promotions, wrestlers, matches, and championships. I am your host, Gerard here. So, let's begin with AAA Lucha Libre with Invades WrestleCon that took place on the 31st of March of this year. Uh, it opened up with a tag team match. Now, however, I wasn't too much pumped on this match because A, I don't recognize the first team, which they call themselves the Natural Classics. I believe these guys are brothers, uh, Tomo and Stevie Philippe. I'm not familiarized with these guys, but from what I understand, they're from uh, they're Australian natives. Uh, so I'm sorry I cannot put uh, too much information on it. Uh, their opponents is Ryan Kidd, a name I'm familiarized with. But I haven't seen any of this guy's uh, work at all. But that's how I see it. But unfortunately, his tag team partner I am familiarized with. I met her before at an event here in San Diego for one of Baja Lucha Libre's stuff. So I was like really happy, uh, Christy Janes. But uh, like I said, I'm not familiarized with the Natural Classics. But they were the kind of like the, the heels of the group, tried to get away with many other tricks. Being the aggressive group, but it was Ryan Kidd who actually got pinned by one of the Philly brothers. I cannot recall which one, but allowed them to win. So I'm really sorry that I don't know much about these guys. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of wrestlers that I've come across, but I don't know much about them. Now our next match is a lumberjack six-man tag team match. Our first team is Mini Abismo Negro, La Hydra, and of course Rey Escorpion, the leader of the Los Miserarios. They're taking on, of course, a Microman, Nino Hamburguesa, and, of course, La Huera Loca, Taya Valkyrie. Now, much of this match, they tried to isolate Taya and Nino Hamburguesa because they're targeting Microman since he's the smallest and possibly, in their minds, the weakest with Link of the team. However, a mini Abismo Negro paid the price when he got pinned by Microman, which is the most embarrassing thing for anybody in his stature. However, as soon as the match was over, we had members of La Empresa, consistent mostly with Puma King and Sam Adonis, being accompanied by Gringo Loco, who are not happy that, that he's stepping away from their side. What they want him is to return back to do what his job is, to carry their titles. So basically, he tries to fight them off, but however, they put him inside of a trash can to send them back to teach him a lesson for walking out on them the last time. So I don't know much about that, but we'll see what happens then. Now, our next match is a sanctioned tag team championship match coming from the National Wrestling Alliance. We got the NWA World Tag Team titles on the line between, with challengers Drago and Aerostar. Now, these two guys have teamed up on various occasions. They're good friends. They're taking on La Rebellion, uh, Bestia666, and Mecha Wolf being accompanied by none other than Bestia's father, Damian666. Now, you know how this tricks works when it comes. You know that they are not that 
Rabbi Leon has been, you know, on a roll in NWA, but having these titles on the line, they'll do whatever it takes to retain these titles. But, however, you know, the only factor that remained is Damian 666 outside of the ring, giving the helping hand to his son and his friend to include they win these, to retain these titles, while the ref did not see it. But, however, it was Bestia who picked up a really good victory with the 1 2 3 to retain the titles onto Aerostar. Our next match, we have a six man tag team match. We got Adomis. Mr. Iguana and Octagon Jr. taking on Abismo Negro Jr., Aris, and Fabio Apache. Now, this was a pretty good match. I have to say, I like the dynamic of this match, how it is. Pure Lucha Libre stuff. I enjoy it a whole lot. Of course, much of this time, they even uh, try to hurt Mr. Iguana's pet Iguana. I don't remember what he calls it. But, however, it was Iguana, Mr. Iguana, who picked up the victory on Aris, giving his team the victory for, for the night. Next match, we have, of course, um, Puma King and Sam Madonna's of La Empresa teaming up with Gringo Loco. The take on Jack Cartwheel, Pagano, and, of course, Drago Kid. Now, this is one of those matches you know is going to be good. As you know, La Empresa always try to prove that they are the true superiors of Lucha Libre, that everybody else is nothing but fakers. So, basically, uh, there were some great moments in this one. But, unfortunately, in this one, it was Pagon who picked up the victory when he pinned, um, how was his name, Gring, uh, Gringo Loco, giving them a really good edge in the match. But you know how the impress is, it will not take that kindly. But, uh, what else? However, the next match we have is a AAA Cruiserweight title. We have uh, Flamita versus Bandito versus um, Laredo Kid. You know this is going to be one of the most amazing Cruiserweight matches you definitely don't want to miss out. So that kind of tells us a lot. I'm like, I but I was impressed with the strength of Bandito when he had both Flamita and Laredo Kid. But you wouldn't expect a whole lot on this one. But Laredo Kid was able to retain the title when he pinned Flamita with the 1-2-3 and it's over. So uh, Laredo Kid has been considered as one of the best cruiserweights. But we'll see who will be the next person to take him out. Now our main event is between Black Toros and... And of course, everyone's favorite clown, Psycho Clown. This is one of those good matches, you know, it's going to be awesome to enjoy. You know, Psycho Clown, he loves to have, he's a bit of a brutal, uh, likes to bring brutality. He's not afraid of it. But he was the one who picked up the victory on this match. However, he his victory was cut short when he was attacked by Jeff Jarrett, being accompanied by his wife Karen. Along be joining the fight is La Empresa Puma and Sam Adonis and Gringo Loco to send a message to saying that his way of Lucha Libre is full of crap. So they think they are far more superior than everybody else. I was surprised that no one came out to help him. I'm s mostly there will be other wrestlers who don't appreciate him. But, you know, this is Psycho Clown is not going to forget what he did. He will get his hands on Jeff Jarrett for attacking him and removing his mask. But La Empresa will sooner have their day because, as you know, they will not tolerate their recent loss. But as soon as their friend Azul DMT is reunited with them, we'll see about that. So what did I thought about the show? It was pretty good. I think it was pretty um, pretty amazing. I mean, the first match, I'm like, uh, you know, but yeah. So we'll see about that. So right now, let's move on with New Japan Pro Wrestling Lone Star Shootout. Okay, so we're now doing New Japan Pro Wrestling Lone Star Shootout that took place on the same week as WrestleMania week. This was on the 1st of April. Let's go with the first match. We have Ren Narita versus Rocky Romero. Now, this is more of a case between student versus teacher. So you probably say Ren Narita is the student, Rocky is the teacher. So we have seen Ren Narita over time has grown up, has been faced with the toughest wrestlers that he could put himself with you know like Tom Lawler um Minoru Suzuki whoever he gets his hands on but I have to say Ren Narita has grown so much and I think he probably will be a good wrestler to watch you know to get behind but I have to say there is a lot of great moments many people would have uh, uh, speculated that Rocky was going to win since he's the master 
But unfortunately, it did not. It ended up with Ren Narita picking up an impressive victory against Rocky Romero when he pinned him. I was like, wow, pretty good. He really, really is surpassing everything that he's learned since he's currently on excursion. We don't know when he'll head back to Japan, but let's keep on supporting him. Next up, we got a pair of eight-man tag team match. We have first team, Mascara Dorada, Yuya Umra, Clark Connors, and of course, the Alpha Wolf, um, Carl Fredrickson, taking on another young line, Kevin Knight, Daniel Garcia, and of course, Finn Juice, David Finley, and Juice Robinson. So this was a pretty good match, How? because the way I see it, you got certain people, like, for example, like Kevin Knight and Yuya Umura. They're both young lions in the LA Dojo at this point. So basically, you kind of can see it. And then you guys got, like, um, two of the graduates of the young lions. We got Clark Connors and Carl Federicks, who are now making a name for themselves. And, of course, there's Mascara Dorada, who is a sens an international sensation coming out of Mexico. And then we cannot forget, of course, uh, Daniel Garcia, his... Uh, position with AEW and all this other stuff. It was something great. I have to say, but I was surprised how it was able to fall into the favor of Connors, Fredericks, and Yuya Umra and Dorada to pick up the victory. It was the American Wolf who actually, I mean, the Alpha Wolf, Carl Fredericks, that picked up the victory for a seam. So we can see that he's going to make some good things in, with New Japan. Now, our next match, this one. You could say, don't poke the bear, or should I say, don't piss off the king himself, Minoru Suzuki. Ever since Killer Cross has been now been released from his previous job, he went out to challenge the king himself, Minoru Suzuki, like people say, careful you what you wish for. Now, these two guys are like in the same caliber. You could say that, you know, Minoru Suzuki is going to kill Killer Cross, or Killer Cross is going to kill. Suzuki, I don't think it matters, but Suzuki is very predictable if you guys ever watch how he is. Of course, he pulled off the armbar off the rope, but in the end, it was the uh, style uh, Carl Gotch pile driver that finished the job and let him win the match. So basically, hope Killer Cross has learned his lesson, but I wouldn't be surprised if he decides to go after Suzuki again for another shot, but we'll see about that. <coughs> <coughs> now, before our next match, we had a surprise visit from, of course, the purveyor of violence, uh, John Moxley. As you know, he had a, an emotional promo, talked about how much he loved pro wrestling. But of course, he had something to say to his opponent at Windy City, right? And we're talking about the Commonwealth Kingpin himself, Will Ospreay. Now, if you guys don't know what's been going on with this, let's ex let me explain how this began. When Will Ospreay was in Ref Pro, he took offense that, of course, uh, John Moxley said he wants to challenge the best wrestlers in the world. He mentioned wrestlers like Okada, Tanahashi, uh, Tagagi, those guys. But there was one name that he failed to mention, and that is, of course, Will Ospreay. However, Will Ospreay took that as a sign of respect but it turns out this was all about because you know mox uh moxley kind of messed up his home after they had a drink of beers and all this so basically that's how it was so the real question is can the commonwealth kingpin defeat a guy like moxley or will he just lose to a guy like him knowing that he is nothing compared like him because as you know he may have an empire but you got a guy who's all about violence but we'll see when that happens on the 16th of april now, our next match, this is continuing more of the US of J Open Challenge. We have Speedball Mike Bailey taking on Jay White. I thought this match was pretty good because, you know, as you know, there's we don't know much how uh, Mike Bailey has grown. As you know, the history of Mike Bailey, he was unable to wrestle in the US. He's been mostly wrestling in the UK and in Japan, wherever he has to do, do internationally. But he looks like that. All that frustration that he had is already out. But unfortunately, he did not make it to the end until the switch put him in the Blade Runner. And it was over. And of course, you breathe with the switchblade. So that sort of thing falls into the favor. 
Now, our next match, this is going to be one heck of a slobber knocker match, as what Jim, Jim Ross would say. We have Dirty Daddy, Chris Dickinson, taking on the Stone Pitbull, Tomo Iroishi. Now, if you guys ever seen Tomo Iroishi, he expects you to hit him hard. If you don't hit him hard enough, then that means you're not doing your job. I mean, I could view Chris Dickinson as that guy, but unfortunately, no, he did not. So, Tomo Iroishi put him on a, on a lariat. It was over from there. So he picked up a very strong victory against Chris Dickinson. However, it's now been told since Minoru Suzuki comes out. As you know, recently, they've been beefing out for a while. So he's telling Ishii he wants a one-on-one -on -one match. Uh, it's still it, By that time, it was still unclear when what is going to happen. But it's officially going to happen later on on April 16th at Windy City Ride. I'm excited. I know everybody else is going to be excited for this. So hopefully we'll get to see it and see what's going to happen between these two strong competitors. So I think that's pretty much it. What we got with New Japan. Let's move on with Joey Janela Spring Break 6. Alrighty then. So we're continuing more with the collective with Joey Janela's Spring Break 6, Part 2. Now, if you haven't seen the first one, then go see it. Now, this one is Part 2. There's some interesting matches that took place. Now, this th this particular one took place on the 2nd of April. For opening match we had is Matt Cardona, along with his main squeeze, Chelsea Green, taking on Chris Dickinson and being accompanied by Missy Miss Hyatt. Now, Missy Hyatt. Now, it was a very unusual moment to see, you know, Chris Dickens. He normally doesn't have anybody by his side. He always handled things by himself. But I'm assuming that he might have needed her to be by his side to deal with Chelsea Green. But there was a freaking moment where Syed kissed Chris Dickens. I don't know if he was, what if he expected it or I don't know. I would have thought he'd probably lose balance, but no. But you know how Matt Cardona comes in. He is the self-proclaimed deathmatch king. Well, Chris Dickinson has to teach the Deathmatch King a lesson. As you know, he interrupted him the last, the first encounter at a GCW event in LA not too long ago. So basically, this is more of like, I'm going to kick your ass and all this. But of course, there was a moment where um, Chelsea Green got involved. She used Miss Hyatt's purse, but accidentally misfired on Matt Cardona. But Chris Dickinson gave a little lariat up to Chelsea Green. And, and then, of course, a bit of a razor's edge onto Cardona, and then she stacked her up, stack him up with Chelsea Green on top. One, two, three, and it's over. So that's teach Matt Cardona a lesson. Don't fuck with Big Daddy. Now our next match, we have Tony Deppen taking on Biff Abusic, formerly known as Oni Lorkin. I thought this match was exactly like I hoped for, a brutal match you wouldn't imagine. Now, this is more some of Tony Deppin's wheelhouse, you know, because he. I feel like both Deppin and Music are in, in the exact same type of wrestling style. But I was so impressed with this match completely. I was blown away, blammo. But it was Tony Deppin who walked out as the victor when he applied this knee strike. And, of course, gain respect from Busick. I think this is one of those matches where, of course, Tony Deppin could take on the biggest and the baddest wrestlers that the wrestling world has to offer. And I think that tells us he may be cocky. He may be a bit of a piece of shit. But he is one of those wrestlers. Put him against the best. But one way or another, he will lose his luck if he continues that way. Next match, we have Young, Dumb, and Broke. Jordan Oliver taking on Mike Bailey. Now, this is one of those matches you know is going to be good. You wouldn't expect this type of match. Now, Mike Bailey has been on a roll since he began wrestling in the U.S. Now, those who may or may remember, Mike Bailey was banned from entering the U.S. country for almost five years, but he's been mostly been traveling from <coughs> the U.K., Japan, and wherever the world is available for him. But since coming to the U.S., that kind of changed a lot of things. I have to say it was a pretty good match. Uh, but the thing is with 
you wouldn't expect, uh, you probably would have wanted Jordan Oliver to win, but no, it was Mike Bailey who won. He picked up a really impressive victory onto Jordan Oliver, and of course, he made, he had the fans at the post-match to say young, dumb, and broke to get Jordan Oliver to, you know, I know you lost, but, you know, these are your fans right here. So that kind of tells us he's showing respect to Jordan Oliver. Now, next match, I don't know how you guys would think of it. We had Effie. Effie versus Minoru Suzuki. Now, I know you're going to say right here. I know what you guys are thinking. Some of you are saying, oh, Suzuki's going to kill him quick. Normally, I would agree. Two are, are, some of you are saying right now, oh, this is going to be interesting. I was in that position too. Now, you probably would not expect how this match was going to be. Now, Effie tried to get Minoru Suzuki. He goes, right here. I don't know if he was trying to get Minoru Suzuki to give him a kiss on the cheek, but instead he got a slap in the face. I'm like, don't ever do that in front of Suzuki. I mean, I don't know exactly how this was going to be, but there was a moment where you know how hard Suzuki is with those chops, you know. You can hear loud and clear. I don't know if it's louder than well, than Gunther or a.k.a. Walter. I don't know, but he, he was enjoying it. But there was a brief moment you see Effie kiss Minoru Suzuki. I'm like, what the fudge? So it was nuts. But luckily for Minoru Suzuki, he was able to put Effie in a chokehold and then finally applied the the got the gotch style pile driver and it was over. <laughs> I have to say this is one of the most interesting matches I've ever witnessed involving Suzuki. I mean, I seen some awesome matches with him, but this this is a very interesting one, to be honest with you. Now, our main event is known as the Clusterfuck Battle Royal. Now, Joey Janela became the first participant. He thought he can kill the Clusterfuck. So he had, we had many wrestlers, you know, from everybody who showed up, like Janai Kai, Yoya, Sam Stackhouse, uh, Jimmy Lloyd, um... Jack Cartwheel. I can go on and on. But, however, I was a bit of surprised how this one ended. It ended with the second gear crew. Now, some of you are questioning, wait a minute. Is this supposed to be one winner? I would say yes on a technicality. But, however, this is GCW. I say they bend the rules however they want to do it. Because... The second group crew was consistent who showed up together, which is AJ Gray, um, Mance Warner, and Matthew Justice. All three of them took out Blake Christian. He was the last person standing because you see the the second gear crew together. Now, they would definitely fight each other if that's necessary. But however, I think whatever reason they wanted to make it look like, okay, we're a team that fights together. We, we bleed together, that sort of thing. Now, I don't know if people would like that or not. To me, that's something I like to question. But I would have mind seeing them continue the match with the three of them fighting each other to see who is the, you know, the toughest SOB. But looks like it ended in that way. So I cannot say exactly if it was a right choice, but I can say that it's kind of interesting to see how they're bending the rules on that. So that's pretty much it. What we got with Spring Break, uh, Joey Janela Spring Break 2, uh, uh, Part 6, I mean 6, Part 2. But right now, let's move on with Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Alrighty then. So we got GCW's. Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Now, some of you who may be new to this channel, you probably say, what the hell is Effie's Big Gay Brunch? Well, this is Effie, who is, in fact, a GCW wrestling star. If you guys ever seen him, how he is, you know, he looks kind of gay. 
He puts out a show every year during WrestleMania week, where, of course, we have wrestlers who are homosexual. Now, if you guys are not fans of that, then you don't need to watch this or hear my review or whatever. I understand, but me, it doesn't bother me. You know why? Because wrestlers can kick ass even if they're gay. Okay? That's how it is. I mean, who could forget Chris Canyon? You know? But that's how it is. But it's a fun show. Now, this took place on the second... No, was it? On the third? Wait, was it? The, oh, yeah. No. On the second. <coughs> it took place on the second of April. So let's go from start to finish. Opening a match, we have Jay Vidal, who represents Future of Star of uh, Future Stars of Wrestling down in Las Vegas, Nevada, taking on the Spanish uh, wrestler named Com Carlos Romo. Now, this is a pretty interesting match. Now, you can look at it as a you can see a lot of representation with Jay Vidal. He does look like the role of a gay person, but it doesn't matter. He knows how to put in his wrestling skills in good use. And that's what makes him really a mate to watch. Now, have you guys ever seen him? He made some brief appearances before on Impact Wrestling when they were doing some shows down in Las Vegas, Nevada, not last year. But this was a pretty good one for me to see Jay Vidal making a very big um, a statement. What a great, re what a capable wrestler he can be. And that's what I like about him. So he won the match by a, a kick strike. That he did up in the middle air. Something similar to Brian Danielson. Or just do like something like the Shining Wizard. We don't know. But it was a good match. Next up we got Eva Sorrell versus Max the Impaler. Being accompanied by uh, Amy Rose. This match was a freaking brutal match for Edith. Uh, Max the Impaler tossed her out of the ring. But unfortunately the ref had no other choice but to count out the match. And it was over. But... Post match, Maxi and Pillar decided to continue to brutalize Edith. There was no way to anybody to stop it, but Maxi and Pillar just left Edith right there. And uh, but they managed to check up on her, see if she was okay. But that's kind of oof, that that was crazy. Now our next match, whenever we have one of these GCW events, you know there's always a scramble match. We have. Kid Bandit versus Shea Perzer versus Rico Gonzalez <coughs> versus Killian McMurphy versus Silvio Milano versus Jordan Blade versus The Whisper. Now, anything could happen in the scramble match, but the impressive is Jordan Blade picked up the victory by applying a chokehold onto Kid Bandit until Kid Bandit realized he had no air, so he had no other choice but to tap. Next up, we got Billy Dixon versus Keita Murray. Now, Keita Murray does have a bit of a mean streak in him. You know, if you guys must know, yes. Basically, homosexuals can be a little meaner, if you know what I mean. But, Keita ha is in fact bisexual from what they're saying. But, he actually, all he's determined is be brutal, but also at the same time try to pick up a win. And that's exactly what he did with Bill Dixon allowed himself to win the match. Now our next match is a four-way tag team match. <sighs> Excuse me. We have Ashton Starr and AC Mack versus MSP Aiden Agro, the Danger Kid versus Ace Perry and Don, uh, Devon Monroe versus uh, Petty Envy, Dylan McQueen, and Kenzie Page. So. This was a very tight. Now, however, this is more of an elimination match. He, basically, we have the first team that was eliminated was Asha Star and AC Mack. Then, of course, Ace Perry and Devon Monroe. Then, finally, we had uh, MSP. And that leaves uh, Petty Envy, Dylan McQueen, and Kenzie Page to win the match. I thought it was a pretty good one. You know, I enjoyed it. Now, deck, next match, everybody's favorite Wrestler that we've seen in GCW, Dark Sheik versus Paro. Now, Dark Sheik was accompanied by Pollo de Mal, de Mal but Paro was brutalizing Dark Sheik. Now, you know, Dark Sheik is the kind of person who's like never says die, never gives up. However, uh, Paro took out the ref, but 
the one person that saves the day for, for Dark Sheik is none other than our host himself, Effie. Basically, there's some beef between both Paro and Effie. Effie dressed up as a ref, so he called it and gave the victory to <coughs> to Dark Sheik. And as for Paro, I'm sure he's not going to be pleased with how this match went out. But yeah. Now, our next match we have is Alley Catch versus Dirty Dango. And I don't know, this match looked more like a freaking stripper type match. Nothing against it. <coughs> but it was really, really interesting. But however, it was Alley Catch who picked up the victory when she applied like some sort of a. I forgot what he, she called it, but it was pretty good. I think it was one of the most. Interesting matches between Alakatch and Dirty Angle. Now our main event. We have our host. Effie versus. A, one of the most. Recognizable exoticos. Coming out of Mexico. Pimpinela Escarlata. I have been a fan of. Pimpinela for a long time. If you guys ever seen Pimpinela. Uh, she normally likes to kiss the men. And all this, she always tries to get away with everything. But however, there was a big moment where, of course, Pimpinela had to bite Effie's ass. And the commentator said, that would be a good teacher. <laughs> and I laughed, and I think it was. But however, it was Pimpinela who picked up a pretty good victory against Effie when she pinned him. And I think it was a real fun match. I think I enjoyed it. It was, even though I'm not gay, but at least I can enjoy a match. That's the whole point of me watching this event. Now, you may not like wrestlers who are gay wrestling. That's fine. Then get off the bus, okay? We're not going to tolerate your kind of discrimination like that way. They're human beings who just want to live in the same world as we do. But what way better way to have fun by enjoying what they can do in the ring? That's what I like about it. So who cares? But it was a fun event. So can't wait to see the next time. Let's see who Effie will bring in and what matches will be taking place. So, but this is one of the collective events. I think I got three more to go. But uh, right now, I believe it's time to move on to the final review, which is AEW Dynamite. Alrighty then. So let's move on with AEW Dynamite. Opened up with Adam Cole versus Christian Cage. Now, you know Adam Cole is not in a happy mood. He is proving he is the best wrestler that he is. Who wants nothing more to obtain is the AEW World Championship. Christian Cage, who also had, is desiring that. But as you know, this type of match goes into the favor of Adam Cole. As you know, he is the best of what he can do. But it was the boom that gave him the better edge. However... Soon as the match ended, Red Dragon once again with their dirty tactics trying to soften up uh, Christian Cage did not work. Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy came out to the rescue. However, Adam Hangman Adam Page comes out, but of course, Adam Cole does not want no piece of him to fight him. However, Adam uh, Hangman decides that you know he's going to give him what he wants. He's going to give him the title match he's been complaining about. So this time he said, because he believed the last encounter was a fluke. But this time, I don't know how Hangman would feel. because I mean, how Adam Cole would feel. Because, however, he did state it the next Friday will be a live televised rampage in Texas. And that's where the thing was getting very more clear. Basically... Hangman says, we're not going to play traditionally. We're going to take this into a Texas death match. Now, you saw in the look of Cole's face, it's like, what the hell? So, basically, this is the kind of match, of course, Hangman can, I mean, Adam Cole can actually get away with. But, has he ever been in a Texas death match? I don't think so. But, we'll see how the, this was going to go. So, if I was Adam Cole, I'd be getting my things prepared. Now, we just began with the men's qualifying match for the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament. We have Samoa Joe, who finally makes his debut, taking on one half of the acclaimed. 
Max Caster. Now, do you think Samoa Joe is affected by all the trash talk with Caster? The answer to that is no. He actually brutalized him completely. Basically, Caster had no clue what the hell he got himself into. Of course, I was imagining people were saying, Joe is gonna kill you. And of course, that's what happened. Until he put the muscle buster on him and qual entered the tournament. However, in the post-match, a video was being sent to him by Jay Lethal and Sanjay Dutt. It appears that Lethal still has a problem with Joel. There was a, he said that whenever he was dealing with problems, he tried calling him, but he never responded. So basically, this is more of like, where the hell were you when I needed you? But he did say that he next week, he's going to roll out the red carpet. Well, let's see how that turns out. Now, Tony Schiavone puts out a good interview coming with the Blackpool Combat Club, where we have, of course, William Regal explaining that we're going to have on Friday, Daniel and Brian Danielson will be facing Trent Beretta in a match. And of course, the newly crowned pure champion, Wheeler Yuta, will be facing against Mo uh, of someone he has never faced, John Moxley. However, Regal did state it. He is impressed with Wheeler. He saw he was impressed. So was, of course, um, Brian Danielson. But he said the one person it's very difficult to impress is Moxley. So we're gonna see how this is gonna turn out. We're gonna see how Wheeler Yuta can he do the same kind of impression that he did to Brian Danielson last time. Well, we're just gonna find out. <coughs> now, our next match we have. The chairman, Sean Spears, taking on the captain, Sean Dean. However, MJF once again goes to the commentary, saying everything was going great. However, the match itself was not important. It's how the match ended. Things got a little crazy when the video camera spotted three security guards beaten up. And it turned out to be Warlow making his way. However, Warlow's... Shenanigans cost Sean Spears the match, giving Sean Dean, who already beat MJF once before thanks to thanks to CM Punk, now he has one match. Over. But however, in the inter in a later interview conducted by T Tony Schiavone, apparently MJF wants another shot of Sean Dean to prove that the last time was a fluke. But he even is daring Warlow to show up the next time. We'll see how that turns out. Now, as I mentioned before, Wheeler Yuta is going to be facing, of course, the um, John Moxley. But it appears that there's growing concern over Wheeler's well-being, and that person was Chuck Taylor. However, Trent doesn't trust him because he feels what he did last time approaching William Regal was kind of like. Being a traitor. So, however, this could be the beginning where maybe Wheeler Yuta can accept the Black Bull Combat Club as his new group because he does fit exactly where he goes with there. And that is something we definitely could see down the line. Now, once again, we have Sammy Guevara along with Tay Conti doing the cue cards, sending a direct message to Dan Lambert asking for this match like the cowards that they are. So, basically, we don't know exactly how Sammy's going to get it, but he knows how to piss people off. That's what he's normally do. Now, earlier in the of the day, footage has revealed the Kingston and Kingston Santana Ortiz attacked the Jericho Appreciation Society as payback for what they've been getting themselves into. But of course, the Jericho Society, uh, Appreciation Society ran like cowards. But Kingston said, if they have a lot of balls. I will face each other next week. That is something I'm sure Jericho will have the balls. But what scheme does he have behind closed doors? You will never know. Now, as you know, Jade Cargill is currently undefeated. We're getting closer to her possible 30th um, win. However, she had a lot of things to say about Marina Shafir. The reason is she feels like she had enough of these women 
for in the, the MMA game coming into wrestling believing that they have they deserve a shot. However, Marina Shafir is the best the prop the problem, but she th- but Jade believes herself as the problem solver. I wouldn't be surprised if Jade Cargill did lose to uh, Marina because they think she thinks she's a total badass. But the real question is, has she ever faced someone like Marina? The answer to that, we'll find out when we get to that day. Now, our next match is a tables match. Something it's been familiarized by the Hardys taking on the Butcher and the Blade. However, the only way to win is by all, both one of the teams being put through the table. So, Jeff Hardy was the first one to be put through the table. And then finally, the Butcher. Then later on, we saw Jeff. But the match would end if either the Blade or Matt Hardy is the ones put in. But luckily, it was Jeff Hardy who was able to help his assistant. This was a no disqualification match. And it ended with uh, Jeff Hardy putting the Blade in. <coughs> A table throwing the Swanton bomb move, so it was a pretty good. However, the Andrade family office showed up to give their help, tried to play the numbers game. But however, Sting decided to give a, give the equalizer, gave a bat right into Private Party, trying to send a direct message to Andrade that he's not not this way, not on my watch. So that is one of the things that we are gonna be seeing. Now, Christian Cage, Jungle Boy, and Luchasaurus, they're getting frustrated with this whole thing with Red Dragon. So, Jungle Boy issued the challenge saying, yes, we're going to put our titles on the line next week. So, we're going to see what happens. Is this a a smart move by Jungle Boy or is it foolish? We'll find out when we get there. Now, as you know, we already have two qualifying uh Qualifiers in the Women's Owen Hart Foundation Tournament, Jamie Hayter, and the newly signed Tony Storm. Now, these two women are basically familiarized with each other outside of AEW and before that. As you know, both these women have made name for themselves in stardom as well. However, this is more like Jamie Hayter believes this is her time. That she's sick and tired of how people talk about Tony Storm. So it looks more like there's a bit of a animosity towards Jamie Hayter to Tony Storm, but we'll see when we get there. Now, our next qualifying match for the Women's Owen Hart Foundation Tournament, we have Julie Hart versus Hikaru Shida. Now, Julia attacked Shida right before the bell ring. Even um, the Varsity Blondes were not liking what they're seeing, but of course, Julia told them to take a hike. I mean, she's throwing a bit of the aggressiveness right now with Sheeta. But however, you know how she is. She's a strong competitor. She would do whatever it takes to hold on as possible until she finally gets the move. But it was the Falcon Arrow that put away Julia Hart, allowing herself to win the qualifying match. However, in post-match, Serena Deeb once again tried to play her sneaky tricks to take out Sheeta once and for all. But Sheeta this time was well prepared she knew exactly what she was thinking but of course Serena Deeb had that smile on her face thinking she finally got into her head Serena Deeb will not stop until Sheeta is out of the picture for good but the real question is can Sheeta really put her out because the last time she cost her an opportunity of the TBS championship but let's see how this one plays out now our last interview we had the swerve giving an indication how there was the Grammys, all this and that, saying that he had a great time. However, as soon as he was leaving, he was attacked by none other than Team Taz's Ricky Stark and Powerhouse Hobbs. But luckily, Keith Lee showed up to help give the helping hand. But what happened next, Hobbs got put through the wall by Keith Lee. If I was Ricky Starks and Taz, I'd be worried knowing that Keith Lee is not someone you need to underestimate. Should not, this should not, Deny or ignore. He's someone you should be considered as a threat. All they care about saying we don't want new people. Well, he got put through a table. So that's the way it goes. Now our main event is is for the AAA and Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles. Both champions from two different promotions. 
will be put on the line. I have to say, one of the great tag team match I've ever witnessed. We have the Young Bucks versus FTR. <coughs> now, you know that the kind of things the Young Bucks, they will do everything in their power to win, but FTR held it together. They knew they, what was at stake. No matter what move they tried to pull, it did not work. But I think the best moment is when they applied the BET trigger, BTE trigger onto Matt Jackson and then the big rig allowing themselves to win the match. I thought this was one of the most amazing matches. Even Tony Schiavone or was it Jim Ross saying, if they Meltzer, if there's a such thing as a 10 star match, he would say this is one, one that should be a 10 star. I don't know if that's something that they Meltzer would do, but we'll see how that plays out. But it was a pretty good match. I enjoyed it. I have to say, AEW did pretty well, even without Cody being in the mix. But I'll explain a little bit about that, so let's do that on, of course, on our very new news updates. So welcome to the news updates here. Uh, first update is, of course, is coming about Layla Hirsch. Um, it's been reported now that Layla Hirsch has suffered a knee injury during AW Dark uh, Elevation tapings. Uh, we don't know yet the extent of the injury. Um, it was during her match, but I highly doubt we're gonna see this when she gets hurt during a for during a dark elevation match. Uh, this is something that has done happened before. Uh, if you guys remembered or not, I think it was in 2020. B Boy went to AEW for dark, but he injured himself, and I did say I highly doubt that they were going to show that, and I believe that's going to happen. But I'm going to assume if the injuries are that bad. For Layla Hirsch, we do know she entered a bit of a feud with her former friend, Chris Statlander. I wouldn't be surprised if that story is going to be postponed until Layla returns. But we'll see what happens. So, like I said, I don't know how extensive is the injury. But if it's bad, then we'll see how that plays out along the way. Now... Two things has come out regarding to Cody. One, as you know, he made his debut re return to a to WWE Raw. His promo was unscripted. Now, some of you probably question, why would it be unscripted? Well, as you know, maybe they want to take a page out of AEW's book. Keep in mind, everything the WWE is scripted. In AEW, they can say whatever they want, but they just got to bypass Tony Khan if for his approval. And I'm sure that's what took place. I'm not sure if they want to do that for the entire WWE uh, roster for them because, you know, everything is scripted for them. Now, the other thing coming out for Cody, there's been talk about Cody said he does believe there will be wrestlers from AEW that will follow him to WWE. Now, I did ask a friend of mine earlier, uh, the same guy who gives me information about WWE, what's been going on. Uh, I co named him Jax. Let's leave it at that. Um, I asked him, who do you think will most likely cross over to, from AW to WWE? And most likely he believes MJF. And I have to say, yeah, I could picture MJF as one of those potential wrestlers from AW to make the jump to WWE. So it's still unclear when that could happen. What it could happen is a possibility. We don't know who else could do it. But for now, let's just stay this way. This course will pay attention to what's going to take place. If there are any WWE superstars that want to, I mean, AEW wrestlers that want to move to WWE, that's something we will pay attention to. Same thing could happen with WWE to AEW. We just got to wait and see. So I believe let's call it a day.
Well, I hope everybody enjoys this episode. Me reviewing everything from the trip, but literally with AAA, the New Japan Moon Star Shootout, both GCW events that are part of the collective, and of course AW Dark. Coming up, we are going to do uh, more stuff that took place during the weekend of during WrestleMania. We have the Impact Wrestling Multiverse of Matches, which I think is going to be interesting to, to, to see how that this one plays out. Because ironically, I am going to do Impact Wrestling as well. Uh, we got Mission Pro Wrestling, which was part of the collective with Bangers Only. This took place on the 2nd of April. But of course, since it's Thursday, we cannot forget MLW and of course NXT UK. So I'm excited for what's going to happen on the next episode. But if there's any news updates on the way, I will report those. But for now, I'll see you guys in the next DWZ time. Same DWZ channel. I must bid all of you adieu. So, goodbye. And have a nice day. Bang.